Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and as ever, we have our panel of Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. And we are, of course, a couple of days off from Independence Day, the 4th of July, which everyone around our beautiful nation celebrated on Wednesday. And we figured we'd actually dedicate some of the conversation this week to Independence Day, to the 4th of July, to the founding of this country, to the United States in general. And I think it's important before we actually begin to talk about these ideas to really make a distinction when we're talking about loving our country and being patriotic versus loving and admiring and being adherent to all of the things that the American government might do. And so I think as we begin the conversation, to draw the distinction between country and government is a very important thing to say. And so just kind of laying that out, I wanted to start to talk about Independence Day. What does it mean to each of us? And I'll say from my standpoint, um, I studied in high school in Russia, in St. Petersburg for a summer. And I began to understand what it was like to live outside of the United States, what it was like to be uh, outside of a country that adhered to the principles of limited government, of free market, of laissez-faire, hands-off economics. And I really began to appreciate Independence Day a lot more than I did beforehand. And this was, of course, between my junior and senior year of high school. And so I personally believe that travel and being elsewhere is something that allows me to appreciate Independence Day much more than I ever have. And I think that you, we were talking before the show that Independence Day is also one of your favorite holidays. It is holidays. my favorite movie and my favorite holiday. Your favorite so, movie. Now, that might be controversial. There's, <laughs> there's nothing more patriotic than Bill Pullman giving that speech against the He aliens, did a very you know? nice he job. He did a nice job. Uh, but yeah, I so I've never traveled, but this is my favorite holiday, mostly because my uh, minor in college was constitutional studies. Okay. So for me, Fourth of July really gained meaning when I learned why, when I learned what it what it is about this country that's so great. And for me, it wasn't necessarily the Revolutionary War. This was a revolution of ideas, right. ideas that have still changed the world. They're still changing the world. So I think it's, you know, you mix that with cheeseburgers, which are my favorite food, and you can't go wrong <laughs> with the 4th brilliant. of July. <laughs> yes. And a quick point of order, is it Independence Day when you call it, or is it the 4th of July? Because I insist on calling it Independence Day. Ooh. I think it goes both ways. It's kind of interchangeable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Something yeah. festive about the 4th of July. It automatically sparks fireworks and thoughts of hot dogs. But Independence Day, you have to stop and think, wait a minute. <laughs> the movie or the holiday. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> but I will say, Richard, that I had a similar experience. I lived out of the country for about six weeks. And when I came back to the United States, I was so happy to be here. Even silly things like ice cubes in the drinks yeah. and getting extra napkins at restaurants. I was really pleased Napkins to Napkins that back. weren't <laughs> tissue paper thin either, right? Yeah. Because you were in Prague. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't all that long ago. No, that was in 2016. Yeah. Oh, that's and just barely. Yeah. Yes. When I came back, I felt so enthusiastic to be in the States. And it was interesting because my experience in Prague came very quickly after. I had spent about four months living in D.C. where I had started off cynical and became even more jaded, if it was possible, um, about the country. But it wasn't, I realized that my feelings weren't so much about the country as they were about the government. And that's not the same thing. No, a a huge distinction to be able to draw. And so we actually have, as you might expect, a few pieces on fee.org that talk about the distinction between country and state or government, right? And one of them is by Fee's founder, Leonard Reed, and it's called The Essence of Americanism. And we tend to revive this piece every Independence Day. See, I call it Independence Day. (laughs) Um, But Danny, you and I were talking about this piece a little bit earlier, and there were some things that you had to say on it. Yeah, I really like, like this notion of Americanism as being a philosophy and not being a um, sort of rah-rah for one particular government, as, as we've been discussing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like this line from his essay. He says, I do not think of the real American Revolution as the armed conflict we had with jo- King George III. That was in a reasonably minor fracas, as such fracases go. The real American Revolution was a novel concept or idea which broke with the whole political history of the world. And he goes on to talk about how Americanism, as it developed, was basically a belief in freedom. Yes. So in particular, that this notion that our rights 
in here in us as individuals, whether you're religious and you think that they're granted by a creator or whether you believe in, in natural rights and you think it's just uh, something that uh, is an individual basis, mm -hmm. as opposed to previous ideas which thought of rights as something that was granted by the state. Right, right. Um, and um, and he, he goes on to say that this Americanism, this, this idea of, of individual rights inherent uh, in the person, that that is what led to what he calls the American miracle. Uh, and, um, and that freedom that, and he, he talks about personal freedom, but he also talks about economic freedom, right. is what led to uh, just an explosion of, of prosperity that we are still enjoying today. And we, of course, have a link to the essay, The Essence of Americanism by Leonard Reed, mm -hmm. just underneath the video here. He's also very explicit about the types of rights that he's actually talking about in the piece. He talks about property rights, mm -hmm. how this was a country that was founded on an idea, again, that the rights aren't from the state, they are not from the government, but they're mm -hmm. inherent to being human. But the human being has a right to property. Also, the rule of law, that all rules that the government imposes or that you know, that nature imposes, that society imposes, should be applied equally. This is a lofty idea, and this is something mm -hmm. that I think it bears mentioning. All of these ideals that we're talking about with Americanism have not been fully realized all of the time, right? Okay. I mean, there are many, many problems with the United States. There are many kinds of criticism that we can levy on what the United States does, particularly the government. I mean, there are many things that we would feel uncomfortable endorsing here on this <laughs> podcast. But we're going to focus today, again, on the ideal, right? I think, Brittany, you were telling me earlier about uh, the fact that our founding documents contain language that say that we're seeking a more perfect union. A more, not a perfect one. Nobody was under the guise mm -hmm. that this is perfect, but it was better than anything that the earth had ever seen at that point. Right. And I'd argue better than we're seeing now. I mean, look right. at Venezuela. Oh, Venezuela. Yeah. We've talked about it before on yeah. the FeeCast a couple of times. Uh, rampant inflation, crime, Socialism. the rule of law is totally <laughs> yeah. out the window. Socialism yeah. prevents businesses from beginning, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. from yeah. taking hold. It's pretty much the anti-American. Well, and yeah. what I love about uh, Leonard Reed's idea of Americanism is that it's something that even non-Americans can mm -hmm. uh, subscribe to. Yes. So we have an intern uh, uh, from Venezuela mm -hmm. and he, Jorge, Jorge yeah. uh, Dressati, and he really subscribes to Americanism. So it's 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 something that can inspire people across the world. Yeah, and it doesn't stop at our borders. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, one thing mm -hmm. Leonard said that it almost to me when he says, you know, we've had all these centuries of war, and it kind of reminded me that this was the beginning of human dignity for all, not just equality for all, but that everyone deserved the yes. human dignity, you know, afforded to all of us. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's inherent in rights, yeah. the dignity in each individual. Yeah. And so there's actually another piece that we should talk about here too, because I feel, again, when we talk about love of country, love of America, Americanism, we can very easily fall into the trap of being you know, overly uh, patriotic or at least effusively uh, patriotic in a way that might mm -hmm. not be understood. And there's an amazing essay that our current president, Larry Reed, no relation to Leonard Reed, <laughs> wrote a couple of years ago. We have a video on our website about this as well. It's called The, tu the True Meaning of Patriotism. Yes. Again, the link is below the video. But Brittany, you've looked into this a little bit. I did. I, I love Larry's work always. But there was one He's quote in particular. He really is. He's just amazing. That really struck me. And it's, patriotism is not love of country. If by country you mean scenery, amber waves of grain, purple mountain majesty, and the like. Almost every country has pretty collections of rocks, waters, and stuff that people grow and eat. If that's what patriotism is all about, then Americans have precious little for which we can claim any special or unique love. And surely, patriotism, patriotism cannot, give me, give, ugh, cannot mean giving one's life for a river or a mountain range. Patriotism is not blind trust in anything our leaders tell us to do. That just replaces some lofty concepts with mindless goose-stepping. That's the poetry that you guys there are talking it is. about. <laughs> It's amazing. And in the essay, again, which we turned into a video a couple of years ago, he does go into the fact that this doesn't mean, again, looking to a politician yeah. or to a government right. or to a legislature to solve our problems, but to loving the idea and, and the principles mm -hmm. under which yeah. the country that you're uh, a citizen of or a member of or that you follow its ideas, and loving those ideas. Yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, quite the opposite of goose stepping 
true patriotism and true Americanism is being willing to criticize yes. very vociferously yeah. your government. And Absolutely. I think Mark Twain had something yeah, to say Yeah, I wrote that. this quote down. It's going to be a little bit of a quote-heavy podcast today, I think. Yeah. But uh, Mark Twain said, patriotism is supporting your country all the time and your government when it deserves it. Well, that's awesome. Th- those are amazing <laughs> quotes. And I hope we have more amazing quotes. But we're going to take a quick break, and we'll see you on the other side of the break. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for Fee.org. Of course, you already know about Fee's incredible articles and written content, but did you know that you can also watch our fantastic videos and listen to our podcast at our website as well? Visit fee.org slash shows to get the latest content from the series you love, such as Out of Frame, Common Sense Soapbox, How We Thrive, The Words and Numbers Podcast, and, of course, The FeeCast. Once again, that's fee.org slash shows for more great content like this. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We've been talking about the differences between different concepts that we sometimes consider to be part of the 4th of July, Independence Day. And two of those concepts, one of them is patriotism. The other one is nationalism, right? So if we're Mm -hmm. talking about differences, they're may appear to be subtle differences, but they're actually pretty dramatic. And there's actually a very good essay on fee.org. We've got the link below um, by Randolph Bourne. And it's all about the state. And it's all about the difference between nationalism and patriotism. And you've written about this, Danny. Yes. uh, Randolph Bourne wrote this uh, sort of inspired by the experience of living in America during the buildup to World War I. And what he was experiencing then really was nationalism. And the way he describes it is sort of um, uh, an, the aggressive aspect of the group um, and, um, and sort of this push towards coercive unity. And so the notion that you can't criticize your government and be a true patriot, that is what is actually associated with nationalism. Because basically, especially in wartime, uh, people f- begin to feel so threatened that they feel that they just have to unify under uh, rally around the flag and mm-hmm. not brook any criticism of, of policy and in, um, enforce unity and in, in homogeneity um, among the populace and be really aggressive towards anyone who's outside the group. So, so that is definitely not what we're talking about with, with patriotism. It's, and, it's sort of talking about if we don't have a unified voice, a unified way of acting, um, that we won't win this war. Exactly. And so this typically happens in times of crisis with armed conflict, with invasion, whatever. If we don't rally around a leader, right, or a an entity that is leading us and has the authority, at least in some people's minds, to lead us, um, if you're against that, then you're not patriotic. Right, right. And so it leads towards blind support for militant foreign policy, but it also leads to, to um, centralized uh, big government domestic policy too. So a lot of times in the the build, build up to war, when you have the, this nationalism, then also there's no dissent in terms of central planning. So like you have a phenomenon called war socialism, where where uh, we every everything becomes well, you know we. We have to have rationing and we have to have price controls to make sure that the armaments industry is getting enough supplies right. and that kind of thing. Right. Free speech, too, right? Because it's, yeah, oh, well, don't insult our leader. Look at, yeah. was it the Alien and Sedition Act yes. passed by uh, John Adams, where it was about don't insult the president because we need to get through this together type Way of thing. Way back when, yeah. one of the original <laughs> patriots even fell prey yeah. to mm-hmm. the notion that you can't go against a leader. Yeah. And so this is something innate, I think, in humans, right? I mean, and that is what separates the way in which up to this point, to varying degrees of success, we've pursued Americanism, as you've said, um, is that we've had this constant pull back to principles, right? The principles of Americanism, as you Mm -hmm. outlined them before, and as are outlined in our founding documents and our sort of collective national lore, free speech, Mm -hmm. free association, the right to defend yourself, the right to own a business and open a business and to to operate. Privacy privacy is Mm -hmm. another one. Absolutely. And so these ideas, again, are things that we need to constantly return to as the good things that Americanism can offer to us. Yeah. And I think that it's important to remember that when we fail to uh, live up to these ideals, it's not that the ideas themselves have failed. It's just that we've let them slip. 
And it doesn't mean that we, you know, throw them in the trash can because one time we forgot. Absolutely. And typically we do forget, like Dan, you were saying, during times of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not only war socialism. uh, It's not the only kind of socialism that we might be able to experiment with. Of course, socialism is when the government is able to operate very large sectors in the economy. Mm -hmm. It's the controlling the means of production, as we've talked before on the fee cast. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to realize that when socialism is put into practice during wartime, it sometimes doesn't leave us, right? right? It can be employed outside of war as Mm -hmm. well. And in fact, John Maynard Keynes, one of the leading lights in thinking about how to stimulate the economy using government fiscal policy, he didn't advocate having that fiscal policy um, stimulate the economy outside of wartime himself. He only saw that as a wartime thing. The problem is, all his adherents, practically, have wanted to continue his socialistic type of economic mm-hmm. policy outside of war. And in fact, you hear it from politicians all over. Barney Frank, a uh, former congressman from Massachusetts, said, government is simply the name we give to the things we choose to do together, which is very interesting. And again, it's conflating a lot of these ideas that we've been yeah. talking about here. Mm-hmm. And it's distressing, right? I mean, if you end up thinking that the only way that we can act collectively is through the state, which is really doing these things uh, by itself, by basically coercing yeah. other people to, to fund it and to mm-hmm. do the, those things, that's a problem. Yeah, I would actually replace this by spontaneous order is simply the name we give to things we do together. All right, you know, I'm going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've mentioned it before, All right. but let's, <laughs> let's remind everyone listening and watching, what do you mean by this spontaneous, spontaneous order? order. Um, well, spontaneous order is the, the act of, well, several acts of people coming together to create one product. Leonard Reed, I pencil, right? I pencil, one pencil is the product of hundreds of work from different people, right. but yet they're all coming together without all, around a cent- the world. all around the world without mm-hmm. a central planner and all contributing to this one beautiful p- pencil. And that is spontaneous order. And I think it goes right in the face of this Barney Frank quote because it's the opposite of that. It's not government. It's We do this in spite of government. That's right. Despite the roadblocks that yeah. they put into <laughs> place, we come together and we build things. And it's the opposite of that kind of uniformity that Randolph Bourne talked about emerging with uh, the nationalism um, that that we that the only way that we can get anything done is if we're all following like marching in lockstep doing the same thing. The, this idea that people can be free and adapt to each other, and it's more like a um, more like a dance than a march. Mm, yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. And so. We celebrated not only America's birthday this week, but we've recently also celebrated another one of Liberty's leading lights, Frederick Bastiat, who we've also mentioned on this uh, show before. And he also has something to say about how we conflate or confuse notions that we typically accept in our daily lives. And he writes in his amazing book, The Law, he says, socialism, like the ancient ideas from which it springs, confuses the distinction between government and society. As a result of this, every time we object to a thing being done by government, the socialists Mm -hmm. conclude that we object to it being done at all. And Mm -hmm. that is a hugely important insight that he was able to offer there. Just because we don't want the state or the government, for example, to undertake a public education program, let's say, or the post office, which (laughs) is another article that you wrote this week that got incredibly high traffic (laughs) and a lot of attention. Um, Just because we don't want the government running first class mail doesn't mean we don't Mm -hmm. want first class mail. Exactly. We believe that through the cooperation that we have through the market process, we can actually get these things. And by the way, far better than how we could get it through the state. Possibly cheaper. Cheaper, faster, (laughs) Faster, better. Right. So, but but then when you say that you're opposed to public education, they say like, well, why do you hate kids? <laughs> you right. know, why do you hate <laughs> learning and education? <laughs> and if you're opposed to you know government health care, it's like, oh, why do you hate sick people? You, why do you want just people to die? And of course, we all see all through all that because mm-hmm. it's all political sort of rhetoric. It's all electioneering. It's all let me explain to you, the voters, why I'm so much more in favor of the children uh, mm-hmm. than than my opponent. Right. So I think when you begin to see the world through the economic lens, through a lens of uh, evaluating what is pro liberty versus what restricts liberty, you can begin to understand why yeah. people who you know might not uh, support certain government programs are not bad people. They just have a different way of going about making those things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of embedded in the word socialism, too, because society is kind of Mm -hmm. like that's what the the prefix of it is is based on. Um, And it seems like a kind of a rhetorical trick. 
It is. It is. Socialism, which is society, versus capitalism. Capital being, of course, the way in which we produce things. And so it's a very odd juxtaposition. When you put the two against mm -hmm. each other, you kind of say, well, of course I want to be social. But mm -hmm. truly, the most pro-social kind of economic arrangement would be the market, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. in the market, we can all choose what we want to do individually, what we want to produce, who we want to patronize, at what prices mm -hmm. we want to patronize. And that's a very social activity, much more social than being told what to produce, right. what to yeah. buy, at what prices and to buy. And what's social about somebody forcing you to do things together? Nothing. What is social is our decision to come together and unite as groups. Right. No, no one likes being told what to do, especially by a central authority who's not particularly keen on your <laughs> interests. And that, that what you said kind of reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we have a lot more to talk about. Americanism, socialism, and a few other ideas that we've been discussing up to this point. But we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the FeeCast. Oh, boy, you know, starting out in the, in the music business or in just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. This is a family business. Our daughters son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I mean, you're always going to run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes for longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. Watch Mama Goldtone and more documentaries about women in business in our How We Thrive series at fee.org slash shows. Welcome back to the FeeCast. Of course, we've been talking about these ideas. We've been talking about very lofty kind of principles and concepts, but we really need to go into what the meaning is behind them, right? And so when I talk sometimes with people, friends or, you know, opponents uh, or in the coffee shop, uh, I'll, I'll say, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll ask, you know, why do these ideas matter? right? Um, you say all this stuff about freedom of speech. You say all this th stuff about laissez-faire or free market mm -hmm. economics, but what does it actually matter? And I tell them prosperity just doesn't happen, right? Prosperity happens because certain ideas are employed and other mm -hmm. ideas are not employed. And in our context of Americanism, I think there are a few different ways we can talk about the meaning of these ideas here, Dan. Yeah, the ideas of liberty, so the, the idea that each individual should own his or herself, and own the fruits of their labor, that that is what results in prosperity. But like you said, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and what Leonard Reed said is that these, the Americanism is responsible for what he called the American miracle, mm -hmm. this uh, explosion of, of prosperity, um, especially during the Industrial Revolution. And he said that the limitation of government is what... Uh, is what freed, released, and released creative human energy on an unprecedented, unprecedented scale. So ultimately, it's just about the productive uh, efforts of individuals. So you can't predict what kind of shape that effort is going to take. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Steve Jobs coming up with the I, iPhone. You know, there's there's nothing inherent about free market capitalism that is necessary about that. But it's just a matter of the ideas where the ideas come in is that people are free to do whatever makes sense, whatever is the best way uh, on the ground to, to create prosperity. And so your point, sort of drawing out the Steve Jobs idea, is that Steve Jobs could basically come up anywhere where mm -hmm. these ideas are in place, right? right. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, for example, might not be able to begin a, a multi-billion dollar corporation such as Apple in a situation where there are no firm property rights, in which there exactly. are, it's very difficult to begin a business, in which it's very difficult to even speak out against a government that is doing things that might not uh, be productive for the beginning of that business or otherwise, right? And so anywhere where these ideas, rule of law, strong property rights, low uh, taxes, uh, laissez-faire, again, uh, hands-off kind of economic policy, any of those places, 
is where these kinds of creative energies can be unleashed and bloom mm -hmm. into things that create value and prosperity mm -hmm. for each of us. Which it seems like the enemy to that is central planning. Um, and as I think is you can't central plan great ideas because look at all the ideas you might be missing. We might not have a Steve Jobs if our government was telling us we could only have one phone and it had to be made by one manufacturer. Right. Or one type of toothpaste. Or one type of toothpaste. I don't want to live in that world. That's not a world <laughs> I want to live in. <laughs> but let's take a step back again because you, you mentioned the term central planning. And I want to make sure that everyone understands what that means exactly. Yeah, central planning where a governing body is essentially making all, all these decisions. And we see that even in occupational licensing, right? That is a central plan saying, we know what everybody else wants, so we're going to make this set of laws. But that's impossible. I don't know what you want. I don't know what Dan wants. I don't know what Marianne wants. So for me to be given the authority to plan for you guys seems asinine because it is. And of course, occupational licensing, the topic of last yes. week's VCAST, where mm -hmm. the government will actually license someone to actually participate in a certain kind of profession. Mm -hmm. Based or on a set of standards that no one's really consented to, right? right. It's their idea. Right. And right. in the same sense that prosperity doesn't come from nowhere, poverty doesn't come from nowhere That's either. That's good. And poverty exactly comes from central planning. That, you know, the difference that you see, I mean, a lot of what people love about being in America is just the abundance of opportunity and the high living standards. Mm -hmm. And and we, you know, sympathize with people who are being crushed by hunger uh, and malnutrition and in insecurity. And But then you look at, the ideas that have prevailed in terms of policy in those places, and invariably, they are ideas where property is not secure, uh, where central planning is running rampant. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important when we talk about these ideas to think about what it's like to live in a country where maybe you have a constitution and and these ideas are written down, but they're not actually in practice. Sure. It's a completely different ball game to actually be able to make decisions regarding your private property than just to kind of like we pretend that you actually own it when we all know that the state comes along and they can take it right away. This has a big effect on the way people act and their everyday decisions. And those decisions can lead to prosperity or they could lead to poverty. And right. that's why yeah. certainty is such an important aspect of the rule of law. If you don't know how to, uh, if you don't know how the law is going to be applied in your certain circumstance and it's uncertain, why are you going to take the risk to open up a new business, for example? Mm -hmm. Why are you going to take the risk to go out and protest a political decision that's been made ostensibly in your behalf right. but might not be in your greatest benefit? Well, when we talk about prosperity, it's not even just financial economic prosperity. It's arts. Um, look at what we have because we're free to create. Uh, we have jazz. <laughs> we have all these amazing American you know, art forms that we get to say that we're home to because we gave people the freedom to actually pursue those things. That's right. When we say production, we don't necessarily mean always on the assembly yeah. line, always in front of the computer mm -hmm. screen, making valuable spreadsheets, if spreadsheets can be valuable. <laughs> and they can, yes. occasionally. <laughs> but we're talking about production of things of value. Ideas. Right. Ideas. Yeah. Each person pursuing what is, by their own standards, their greatest good. That's right. And meaningful. And hopefully mm -hmm. in a marketplace that's free to find these mm -hmm. ideas, to find these products, to find these pieces of art, other people will find them valuable as well. And again, that's something that foreigners can even subscribe to in terms of Americanism. Mm -hmm. A lot of what, what, what foreigners love about America are the cultural uh, output that, that we have. And so they love jazz and they love uh, blues and, um, and you know, the, the, what was the British invasion was, pe you know, people like, like Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and, and John mm -hmm. Lennon, you know, being like really inspired by the American blues tradition and then the rock and roll tradition that was coming mm -hmm. out, out of that and then, you know, feeding that back in and having that cross-cultural um, feedback. And so, yeah, that is really something that everyone can admire and repair to, a standard that all can repair to. And we've been talking a lot about America being a beacon, not only for economic prosperity, but cultural prosperity as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to circle back because we, as Americans, all three of us, all four of us, are patriotic, uh, or at least we're citizens of the United States, right? But you don't have to be a citizen of the United States in order to ascribe to the views of Americanism, as we've mm -hmm. outlined them here. Yeah. And I think one thing we're, one place where we're seeing this happen right now is Iran. Um, the, the youth of Iran right now are very into American ideals, and it's actually changing things. I know I watched a video the other day that women are now dancing in the street just because they can, and they're dancing to American music. And that's having an, that's having an impact because now these people are running, or not running, I don't know how their elections work there, but are now able to hold positions of power. Right. And I so think, we're seeing this change. I think this is an example of what we've seen in American history and across the world of how changes actually occur. They start with culture. They start with we the people, not with the guys up top. 
Right, and, and Iran is a great example of that because, you know, that kind, what, what people in Iran, what they love about America is the freedom that they're inspired to emulate. Uh, what, what terrifies them and what threatens them is uh, the foreign policy of the U.S. central government. And so, again, trying to centrally plan um, uh, the, the American ideals and trying to export them by force, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that always backfires. And so... Obviously, we have the ballot box, right? We can go and elect certain people who, in theory, represent our mm-hmm. best wishes and our aspirations and our dreams. And there's a lot to be said about how they don't, in many cases, maybe even most cases, actually represent the will and the mm-hmm. wishes of the people whom they represent. There's a topic or an idea here that you can criticize by criticizing, right? Right. Or you can criticize by doing something else. You can criticize by creating. Yes. Which is a term that you love, absolutely. I love it, yes. And I stole it from Max Borders, who was our former yes. editor of The Freeman. Good so friend shout, of shout out to Max Borders. I love that because you can sit in a room and criticize all day long. And what are you doing? You're really just making each other angry sitting there and criticizing. But that's what entrepreneurship is. Uh, we're creating. So if you don't like the way the post office is run, Lysander Spooner created his own. He criticized by creating. And that's what I think we need to see more of. Now, his was shut down. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But Uber, but Uber wasn't shut down. But Uber wasn't shut down. Right. Great point. So we're seeing this already. We are already criticizing by creating. And going to the Leonard Reed quotation that you had earlier, Dan, we're talking about unleashing creative potentialities, creative energies in order to be productive. And if we're not able to be creative, if we're not able to create value for other people, then what use is any idea? Right. Mm -hmm. But the point is that the ideas under which this country were founded were not blood and soil. They were not a certain type of tribe against another tribe that carved out a certain part of land that they called their own. These were ideas. That's the true beacon of America is the idea under which it was founded, which is, again, we look at our founding documents. We had the ability to create a government all of our own and we have the ability to throw it off if it Mm -hmm. violates liberty again. And the Uh, opening of the Constitution says, we the people, right? Not always that it's able to fulfill that promise, Mm -hmm. but that that's the idea. And that's an amazing way that we've set up our country to unleash those creative energies that each of us have. And I, for one, love that about our country. And that's why I celebrate Independence Day. Well, we've enjoyed an Mm -hmm. awesome conversation. I hope you have too. I hope you had an awesome Independence Day, and we'll see you next week at the FeeCast.